The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Mike Willett at the Intertribal Council of Michigan's Three Fires Cancer Consortium. Welcome to our technical assistance webinar. This webinar is titled, Helping Native American Moms and Babies Using Alcohol Screening and Brief Intervention. This technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the Three Fires Cancer Consortium. Our presenters today are Pamela Gillen, Project Director at the University of Colorado, Denver, and Katie Langland, Program Manager and Coordinator for Tribal Choice, Denver Public Health. No commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. And for a full listing of all the resources, the webinar archive video, and even the survey for today's webinar, the evaluation, please visit www.itcmi.org slash ASBI webinar. Again, that's www.itcmi.org slash ASBI webinar. The learning objectives and outcomes for today's webinar. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to learn about the impacts of alcohol use during pregnancy, get introduced to alcohol screening and brief intervention, ASBI, and learn about the benefits of efficiency and of adopting ASBI in a tribal clinic setting. And now at this time, I present to you Pamela and Katie. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Pamela Gillen, and I will present uh, Interdispersed with Katie. So we will kind of go back and forth in a little bit of a tag team routine. Um, and the, the title of the webinar today is Helping Native American Moms and Babies by Using Alcohol Screening and Brief Intervention. Uh, again, the learning objectives we just went over, so I don't think I need to restate those. Um, so the impact of alcohol uh, exposed pregnancies are, are very um, prevalent in society um, and they can cause a lifelong uh, disabilities, including physical, behavioral, intellectual, as well as um, the full spectrum of what we is known as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So we'll talk about that a little more as we go into the training today. Um, it also increases other risks with the pregnancy, including miscarriage, stillbirth, as well as prematurity and SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. The effects of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders on the developing fetus are very broad and um, it makes it sometimes difficult to make a diagnosis because we have a dose timing issue, uh, how frequent the mother drinks as well as at what time during the pregnancy she drank. But those effects can include things such as intellectual disabilities, um, learning disabilities within that or even uh, 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 mental retardation, we can have behavioral issues by, in and by themselves and or um, uh, issues with understanding. We can also have physical differences, so actual physical um, birth defects. Well, the one thing we do know, whoops, went a slide too fast. The one thing we do know is that fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are completely preventable. Uh, the key is no alcohol use during pregnancy, um, but there are some caveats as to why that doesn't seem to work so well. Many women do know that it's not safe to drink alcohol during pregnancy, and yet um, we still continue to have uh, about 10% of the pregnancies are alcohol exposed. So um, just thinking about percentage of unintended pregnancies in the United States, we know that uh, most people think it's in there somewhere, but if you were to, to ask this question in poll, 
most people would come in around B or C, but it's actually D. So there's a fairly high number of unintended pregnancies in the United States. And if you couple that with about 50% of women drink some amount of alcohol at any given time, then you have a fairly high exposure rate that um, is not necessarily alcoholic, but just drinking. Um, again, um, those 45% of pregnancies are unintended, but the more majority are actually um, not using or incorrectly using contraception. So we have certain women who are just not using it correctly, but again, a lot of them are just thinking that they're not going to be sexually active and so are not currently on a contraception. Um, and then we have that exposure window for the women who do know to not drink during pregnancy. They still have an exposure of that first four to six, sometimes up to 10 weeks, depending on when they realize they're pregnant. The other piece is about 3 million women in the United States are at risk for an alcohol exposed pregnancy. So that's a fairly high rate. Uh, we also know that we've had a recent um, rate of uh, alcohol uh, rate around one in 20 um, pre uh, children are exposed with an, have an actual diagnosable AF, a FASD. So one of those diagnosis, diagnostic pieces in the spectrum. And again, about 10% of pregnant women um, of childbearing age, and this is the adult women, uh, report current alcohol use. So again, um, these are pregnant women who continue to drink, and that's for a multitude of reasons, including um, just poor information, um, the, maybe the media, they've got bad information, that type of thing. So what is considered a standard drink? When looking at, um, let me do something here, sorry. I got emails coming in. Um, a standard drink is basically, we're looking at um, different alcohols and saying that of these alcohols on this slide, all of these have the same amount of absolute alcohol. So you have a standard um, 12 ounce can of beer. And this could be any kind of beer like a Budweiser, a Coors, a Miller. Those type of beers are typically about 5% alcohol. Now, you know, if you go to a brewery or other places that you can get alcohol content as high as nine or even sometimes higher percentages. The malt liquor in a smaller glass, so this would be eight to nine fluid ounces, um, has about 7% alcohol. And then the um, wine glass is about 12% alcohol. Uh, for about a standard five ounce glass of wine. And then you have your hard liquor, which is about 40% uh, alcohol. But of those drinks, each one in and of itself is the same amount of absolute alcohol. So it doesn't matter if you're drinking a beer, a shot, a glass of wine, or a malt liquor, you're still exposing that developing fetus to the same amount of absolute alcohol. And I think that's an important note. It's also important to have conversations with clients around their alcohol and be talking about the same thing. Um, so as that fetus is developing, you'll see on this fetal development chart that we have a range of weeks where the it's the period of the embryo up and through the um, eighth week, and then we go in the period of the fetus. The darker purple line is where we have the most side effects for birth defects. Um, and again, uh, that's we're seeing um, this brain, is, the central nervous system is developing throughout the pregnancy and brain is very sensitive to alcohol. So we see a lot of brain injury when we are drinking alcohol during pregnancy, even at smaller amounts. Um, you can see also that ears, eyes are also developing for, over time for quite a bit. But at any given point, if that woman drinks alcohol during that development of cells that are developing and drinks enough dose for that. So the timing dose is what we're going to see the different various impacts on those developing, um, on that developing fetus in the pregnancy. Now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Katie. Thank you, Pam. Mm -hmm. But there is good news. We can completely prevent alcohol exposed pregnancies. And the two ways that we can actually do that are to reduce risky drinking or completely eliminate it and use control, birth control effectively 
So the good news is that these alcohol exposed pregnancies are completely preventable. So one way to do that as counselors, practitioners, and even medical providers is to do alcohol screening and brief intervention. And what that is, is a validated set of screening questions to talk about risky drinking patterns. And it can be just a short conversation with your patients or your clients, talking them about their alcohol use. And if it is high risk drinking, to refer women and men to specialized treatment for patients who have alcohol use disorders. So again, referring women who are high risk drinkers to alcohol treatment disorder clinics or outpatient so that they can reduce their drinking if they are of childbearing age. The CDC has created this document planning and implementing screening and brief intervention for risky alcohol use that helps practitioners do alcohol screening. We actually use this within our tribal project and program. There is another screening tool that is being developed through the CDC for use in tribal communities. And this is a very easy guide in order to be able to start with planning and implementing ASBI within your settings. And so you can go on the cdc.gov website and find this. And the tribal document should be available within the next few months. That's currently in the clearance process at the Centers for Disease Control. So patients will want to talk about their risky drinking with providers. Providers can bring it up in a very casual way. They can talk to them about their risky drinking levels. As Pam had said, talking about standard drinks is really important. Patients may say, oh, I just have one drink a night, but it might be several ounces over what a standard drink is and might be actually equivalent to three, four, five, six, seven drinks. And so talking about what a standard drink is, what a risky drinking level is, and then talking about the health consequences is very important. Many of us have heard that a glass of wine a night is good for your health. There is no safe drinking level for women who are pregnant or can become pregnant. The one drink, one glass of wine a night is only for heart health. It can have some serious consequences for other types of health issues. And so that's something that maybe is unclear when we hear in our, our media. And also using a validated screening tool is important with patients, standardized questions in order to be able to talk to patients about their risk drinking. And then for those of you that the clients who are overusing or high risk drinking, to be able to refer them to a treatment center or some other options. So the way that we can talk to patients is also about what are the standard drinks and what are the risk drinks, risky drinking levels. For example, for women, it's no more than one drink a day, two drinks a day for men, and for women, it's no more than three standard drinks on one occasion, or else it's considered binge drinking, and no more than four drinks on one occasion for men. And again, talking about the standard drinks is really important. And our counseling that we did in our family planning clinic in Denver and other venues, and even in the tribal settings, really talking about how many drinks someone has and what a standard drink is, sometimes is a surprise. I was surprised at the level of number of ounces in a glass of wine because many times maybe at a restaurant they might over pour and you're actually drinking one and a half standard drinks. So one way to do that is setting the stage. This is the first step. So as many counselors do, as many practitioners and providers do within their counseling session, it's really important to establish rapport. And there are many ways to do that. So of course, open body language, eye contact, showing empathy, respectful listening and not interrupting, and then avoid the stigmatizing language. Something that might be accusatory, you don't drink, do you? 
an accusatory question like that or a close-ended question, something that may not open the conversation, and then normalizing the screening. This is something that I ask all of my patients. For example, might be a way to normalize that language for your clients so that they know that you ask every patient the same question. The second so, step. Oh, I thought I was coming in, Katie. Sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, Pam. Yeah, so, uh, so the next step is always to use a validated screening tool. So there's many out there, um, uh, but some of them that are more friendly for clinics are the NIAAA, the National Institute of Alcohol and Alcoholism. They have a single uh, question alcohol screen, which is useful for uh, clinics that are busy and fast and want to just get a quick quick answer. So that question is typically looking for the um, the binge drinking. And then the uh, US Audit C is developed from the first three questions of the audit, which looks at that frequency and quantity. So it's really looking at um, how, how often do you drink and then um, how much do you drink on any given occasion. And then you're also looking for that binge episode. So um, the next uh, slide is, um, sorry, going here, is actually looking at a screening question. So um, in our clinics, um, that uh, single alcohol question here, how many times in the past year have you had X or more number of drinks in a day? And that's why it's important to know that binge drinking episode. So screening anyone in clinic, whether it's a woman or man, childbearing age, uh, teenager, um, those are important uh, parameters to know. And so oftentimes when we're talking about non-pregnant teens, for women, we're talking about, uh, for teens, any alcohol use above um, uh, the age of um, 18 or under the age of 18 is considered risk drinking for teenagers. And then for uh, over the age of 18, um, women, again, you want to have them less than that binge drinking episode and for men. And then when you age, of course, after 65, you want to go down in your drinking levels for both uh, sexes because of um, the body detoxes alcohol differently. The audit C question is pretty um, nice. It's really how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? So the person can quickly answer never, uh, less than once a month, monthly, and then you add these different scores up. Or how many drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day when you're drinking? So again, we're looking at how often and then how much, and then you're also looking at how often do you have that binge drinking episode? So we're looking for that. And there's, there's ways to do this question. You can just embed it into your overall health questions. When you're talking about, you know, do you wear a seatbelt? Do you wear uh, helmets when you ride bikes? Um, it's nice to embed this just into normal everyday health questions. Oops. So for men, again, um, on that audit, if they're drinking, if their score comes up, at, sorry, oh, goodness gracious. Um, for men under the uh, under 65, a score of eight or more is considered positive. So on that audit, when you scored your answers, that would give you a, a kind of a baseline as to where you go with this. And again, the, we're talking about men in general, not 65 or older. And then for women who are non-pregnant, again, we're looking for um, that they're positive, they're seven or more on that scoring uh, tool of the audit seat. So again, non-pregnant women. So we're really, if we're going to prevent alcohol exposed pregnancy, we really need to start gearing some of our work towards that preconception care uh, individual. And so when you're talking to folks about their drinking patterns in a clinic, oftentimes providers would say, well, we just don't have time to implement this. But really, it could be implemented just like a blood pressure screen in any clinic. Um, it's a quick, easy question. Um, you can you can do it in several ways. Um, but one of the things that's really nice, if you notice on this pyramid screen, is that you see that the majority of clients coming through a clinic are actually um, not risk drinkers. And so, and this is also true in native communities. So you'll have 
that group that are abstinent that just don't drink. Um, and then within that, you'll also have a group of folks that are drinking below those risk levels that we talked about. So they're drinking as a woman uh, that's not pregnant three or less at one sitting and no, never more than seven in a week. Or for men, it would be the uh, four or less at a sitting and never more than 14 in a week. And then you have this small percentage up here and each community will vary depending on your alcohol use. Uh, but you have that risk or hazard of use, which is only about 16%. It can vary from communities or ages. But that's nice to know because that's your group that you're going to do your brief intervention with. The 80% you're going to talk about, you're doing a great job, continue to do this. If you do decide to become pregnant, uh, please make sure that you reduce any drinking that you're doing down to um, no alcohol while you're planning. And then that 4%, go ahead and do the brief intervention with them, but then also know that that's probably a group that's not going to move too far with a brief intervention, but it may um, act, that brief intervention can act as that catalyst to move them into a treatment program that they might need. So when, um, the, again, you get a negative screen, like we were just talking about that group, that big blue area on the pyramid, it's really nice to really affirm to that patient that they're doing a good job, you know, they're, they're doing healthy behaviors. Um, you know, again, if you know some of the harms of alcohol, um, you know, it increases breast cancer, it increases colon cancer, several cancers, lung cancers. It also puts you at risk for other accidents and um, DUIs. It puts you at risk for women, for um, date rape, different things like that. So you can talk about the harmful effects of alcohol and that affirming that they're doing a really good job by drinking at the rates they are drinking. Um, you can then again give that advice if they do just to become pregnant to be sure to cut back to a zero amount of alcohol. It also opens the door for you and that client to start to have conversations and um, the reason I like to screen every visit, every clinic is that I know that life circumstances happen and that often we may see a client that is drinking at very low levels or not drinking and has a life crisis and all of a sudden their drinking patterns can tra change drastically or an elderly patient that's working and then goes into retirement, their drinking patterns can also change. And it says here to rescreen annually. That's the advice of the least amount that you should you should be screening with. But again, I, I think it, it's best if it's set up as a just like a blood pressure screen. It becomes very normalized and easy to administer. Um, a positive screen, again, we want to assess further, so we really want to go in. If they did po uh, have a positive screen, we really want to find out, you know, what, what's going on, you know. Um, is there circumstances that are happening in their life? And this is where the brief intervention can happen, and it's um, pretty quick and easy to do. Uh, it's basically having that patient um, talk to you with open-ended questions, really asking them about, tell me more about this drinking and what do you make of this screen that you screened in positive? Those are types of questions you could go further with the client. Really helps you get a sense of, you know, what they think their drinking looks like. And oftentimes what you'll find is that they're surprised that they actually thought that their drinking was in a normal range because they drink like their friends and their age group. And so again, it's it's a way of kind of getting a better handle um, and talking with the patient. And then you can do some brief advice um, if, uh, if that seems like this client is open to the conversation around their drinking. And so you may, you know, um, talk about are there areas in your life that you might want to work on to kind of change patterns like this. But again, we're wanting that patient to be the expert in their life and kind of guide. We're the guiding the conversation, but we're the aim is to have the patient choose the healthy behaviors and the amount of alcohol they would like to reduce. And this can get kind of tricky in clinic situations because especially if we're working with somebody who's at risk for an alcohol exposed pregnancy, they're not effectively contracepting and they're risk drinking and they're really not interested in changing their drinking patterns. And we will definitely want to have some conversations about other ways to help prevent that alcohol exposed pregnancy. But again, um, allowing that client to make the choice. And um, the, uh, I think I'm 
go okay here we're good so expert and youth screening guidelines are a little bit different and i just wanted to talk about um there's a new um protocol that i saw on the web that i thought was really helpful and it's i believe it was on the um American Academy of Pediatrics uh, website, uh, but it really um, helps us look at kind of adolescent use in a different light because oftentimes when we look at adolescents, we just say, well, you're drinking, that's risk drinking. But I think it's important to know that there are variations. And so there is a site where you can um, look at um, the elementary student, middle school students and um, start with friendly questions. So you really want to talk to them around side door opening to drinking because we're talking to them more about you know have you ever been around a friend that was drinking or have you ever ridden in a car with someone that's drinking so we're really kind of talking about very light questions if we um, transition um, because transitions to middle and high school increase risk we'll choose questions that maybe align with the student student school level as opposed to age for students 11 to 14. So again, kind of keeping in mind that as kids transition in age, um, we'll have different conversations. We also keep in mind that the students as they drink, it may be on uh, Sundays at a church as part of a, a church ritual, which is a little sip of a wine, which would be um, not considered a risk drinking behavior. Uh, but again, we really want to start that conversation early because um, onset of drinking can be as young as um, seven to nine years of age. And so here's some uh, screening questions that you might see. Um, you ask the two screening questions with, um, and then it kind of gives you an idea if it's at risk. So elementary from nine to 11, you're asking the friend question first. So are, do you have any friends who drink beer, wine, or any alcohol, or any drink containing alcohol in the past year? And then um, any drinking by friends heightens your concern. And then the next question would be um, uh, any drinking. How about you? Have you ever had more than a few sips of beer or wine or, or drink containing alcohol? Again, any drinking would put them at high risk. And so then you would really want to do some a lot of work around educating them about the risks of drinking and the harmfulness and especially some brain education awareness around that. Middle school, we're getting into that 11 to 14 year of age. And so different kids are going to have different um, areas. But again, uh, you ask the friend question first, and then again, if there is any friend drinking, it heightens concern. Then uh, again, asking about how about you in the past year on how many days have you had more than a few sips? So now we're kind of getting it into not have you ever had, but how many have you had? So we're giving them permission to give that conversation and talk. Any drinking, it's either moderate or high risk, and there's an actual chart that gives you information. So a couple drinks here or there is really more of what we're starting to see, what we call that kind of um, experimentation. And if they've just done that a little bit and then they've kind of backed off, then that's not really of too big of concern concern but it is something to have a conversation and when you get into that high school age that 14 to 18 um, you ask the patient question first so you kind of flip gears and in the past year on how many days have you had more than a few sips of beer wine or any drink again and then you can have variations of lower moderate or high risk and there's a chart that's going to come up in the next slide that'll kind of show you how you fit this into the algorithm and then uh, depending on if it's moderate or high risk then you'll ask about friends so um, how much so if your friends drink um, how many drinks do they usually drink and again you're looking for that bench drinking patterns because that puts this uh, client or teen at high risk for engaging in that behavior even if they haven't started yet um, so this screen uh, this is your algorithm and so um, you can see like uh, at age less than 11 um, any days in the past year of drinking is all red so they're they're at high risk but when you get say 17 and you've had one to five days in the in a past year it's very low risk but if you're six to 11 days or uh, even up to 23 days it's moderate and then um, when you get into that high risk, you want to do the brief interventions and then possible referrals. And then again, on uh, 18-year-old, if they're drinking, we'll give brief advice in the low risk areas, um, brief advice or motivational interviewing if they're in the moderate area. And then if they're drinking more than 52 days in a year, then that's a possible referral. So again, it's a nice tool. Uh, there is a guide um, in there and I believe 
if I don't have that, oh yeah, so there's the, the link to that guide at the bottom of the screen. And so I think it's very user friendly and useful for folks that are working with teams. And the uh, posit is a questionnaire that you can use with teams as a screen, um, but it's extremely um, long. Uh, it's got a total of 139 questions. So there's also, uh, uh, there's two screens out there and I don't know why we don't have the other one on here, but this one was developed by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And it's a really good validated screening tool. So if you do have teens that are drinking, you could go in and, and go through this um, and really oversee all of the different questions that you need to ask. But it would need to be a clinic that has time to really sit down with a teenager or an adolescent and also um, to make sure that the parent is not present when this is happening. So the um, next slide um, is uh, really going for uh, Katie to go ahead and talk about choices, which is an intervention for women um, prior to pregnancy. Thank you, Pam. So Pam and I worked on both in the Denver Health STD Family Planning Clinic, we implemented this intervention with women of childbearing age, both in Denver, and then it was expanded to work in some different tribal communities throughout the United States. And it's an effective behavioral intervention that was shown to reduce risk for alcohol exposed pregnancies. And so it's helping women choose healthier behaviors. And the way that it is done is by either a four or two session intervention for women who are within the childbearing age, normally 18 to 44 years old. It could be a little bit outside of that range, but it provides an education to women. Many women are unaware of being alcoholic exposed while they're drinking, or like Pam had said, some women don't know that they're pregnant for four, six, maybe even 10 weeks. It talks about ambivalence within the behavior change and talks about healthier choices. And we'll go into that within this slide set. So it's a choice for women within this intervention to either reduce their alcohol use or increase effective contraception or both. Within the work that I did in our Denver Health Clinic, a lot of the women actually chose to do both, to reduce their alcohol and increase their contraception. Initially, it could have been that they've decided to only reduce their alcohol use, but later through the follow-ups might choose to increase their birth control once they've made some positive behavior changes and want to continue on with that. And so that was a quite, incredible to see the women who actually made changes and then wanted to continue on and make even healthier choices. One of the large frameworks for choices is motivational interviewing. It is a very effective style of counseling that tries to find the motivation within the client and what could help promote positive behavior change. It uses communication skills such as active listening, non-judgment, and exploring some ambivalent and what the client would like to change and how the client might change, some of the barriers to effective change, and then being able to explore those barriers and help break them down for women. One of the largest things that can be a disruptor for behavior change is ambivalence. So as you see here on the slide, she sees kind of both sides of it. There are some good things that she's getting from her behavior and some not so good things. The women in the clinic, when I asked them, what are some good things about your drinking? They often were surprised because they thought that I was going to judge them or just to assume that I'd talk about all the bad things about their drinking. But many times they are actually getting some benefit from their drinking. Maybe they feel more social, maybe it helps them relax, what have you. So a lot of times exploring this ambivalence and trying to break down some of these barriers is really helpful for the positive behavior change. 
So for example, some of the comments that we heard is, I love throwing back a few with the guys on the weekend, but I do worry a little bit about my heart, or I hate the calories in wine, but it helps me unwind. I've never really had any consequences from my alcohol use, but I'm concerned that it increases my chances for risk. So in these statements, you will hear kind of the both sides of the coin. So someone, may not like the calories, but it does help her unwind. Or she hasn't really been concerned much because there hasn't been a lot of consequences, but now she's thinking that there might be some not so positive things about her alcohol use. Another thing that Choices does is it provides personalized feedback. So based upon what the counseling session discusses and what areas are brought up, that actually is something that is specifically discussed and targeted with someone. So it may talk specifically about her alcohol use only on the weekend, or maybe she's really stressed after going to school and taking her finals, or maybe she doesn't use contraception with an old boyfriend that she sees at the bar. And so it will be uh, very personalized for the women, and that's helpful with the positive behavior change because you can really talk about the specific behaviors that are putting her at risk and then how to reduce those behaviors. Of course, there's resistance to change. Many of us know some of the not so positive things we're doing in our behaviors, but it can be hard to change. There may be some resistance to that. And again, we may be getting some benefit from these not so healthy behaviors. So as you see here, I'm willing to make some lifestyle changes as long as I don't have to do anything different. We get some uh, resistance when we do wanna change. So Choices does talk about someone's readiness to change, to reduce their high-risk drinking, or to increase their contraception. And sometimes women will not be ready to change, but hopefully we're planting that seed and then we might be able to talk to them about that in the future. The motivational interviewing strategies do help with the change talk. So when we hear those little pieces where she might have seen the consequences of her drinking, or maybe she's tired of coming into the STD clinic because she had a night of drinking and then had unprotected sex, we might be able to work on some of those little nuggets and be able to work on the change talk where she could make some positive changes in order to reduce her risk. There's also a daily journal that the women fill out talking about their drinking, their contraception use. And so oftentimes they might see a correlation that the higher risk drinking they have, maybe the less prone they are to using contraception. And then you would see a link between drinking, not using contraception, and then maybe having unprotected sex. And it is, again, that personalized feedback. So it's women working on their own goals. Some women may decide to only reduce one drink a week. Some may decide to reduce substantially. Some women may decide to talk to a provider about birth control, or someone might immediately want to get on the birth control pill or get an IUD, for example. So more information about choices can be found on this website. These slides will be available after, after this webinar, so you can also uh, reference that there. But the centersfordiseasecontrol.gov does have some really good resources for choices, both in the original research settings and also we'll have some documents there for the tribal work that we do and have done, so you will be able to find that on the cdc.gov website. And so now we'll start talking about why we want to provide prevention services. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pam, and she's gonna talk more fully about why we need to do this and why it's really important to prevent alcohol-exposed pregnancies. Okay, and so as, uh, 
uh, Katie talked about the um, implementing choices into various settings. There's lots of ways that can be done with either a, um, a provider doing the screen and then a patient navigator or a medical assistant doing the intervention or a medical assistant doing the screen and maybe a behavioral health individual within a setting doing the screen. And so when we worked in tribal communities, we did lots of variations of this intervention. I think the one of the key points I just wanted to stress before I moved on, one of the most important things to work on is that the staff really have a really strong understanding of motivational interviewing and that they're really open to meeting that client where the client is and that client's the expert because it's really important to not try to push or change that client to do what you think they should do, but really move that client in the direction that um, is gonna best work with that client. So one of the things that is so important to preventing an, uh, a pregnancy when women are drinking is that we can get um, a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, these disorders are, are very prevalent, as mentioned earlier, um, in the United States. I think the latest data is about one in 20 um, children in school settings has an FASD. This is not a clinical diagnosis, but it is um, all the different characteristics that can occur when a woman drinks or when a uh, child is exposed to alcohol during a pregnancy or a fetus is exposed. So there's lots of variations and, and those can um, look like, sorry, uh, these are the kind of the diagnostic terms that we would use. So uh, the fetal alcohol syndrome is a cluster of effects that we see where that's kind of the most commonly known diagnosis and that's where we have the abnormal uh, facial features as well as some form of brain injury, whether it's a structural injury, a small head circumference, or um, just um, uh, injury to cells that cause learning disabilities or, or mental retardation, that type of thing. And then small head uh, and small growth and a height and weight uh, at or below the 10th percentile. Partial fetal alcohol syndrome has some of the components of the facial and then we'll have some of the components of the, um, we'll have the brain injury and then some components of the height and weight. Both FAS and partial FAS do not need to know if mom drank. Um, so that's useful when we have kids in the foster adopt system and we don't have mom's history. The alcohol related neural developmental disorder, ARND is really important that we um, do know that mom drank, so it's really important to document um, drinking episodes that we learn about. Oftentimes, women will, will present with uh, something that indicates maybe they were using opioids or maybe they were using meth or cocaine, and we are so upset about the illegal drug that we forget to ask questions about the alcohol use, which is almost always prevalent. And so that's a really important question. Alcohol-related birth defects is basically if that dose timing, because alcohol is what we call a teratogen, it actually causes birth defects. So whatever's developing at that point of exposure can result in a birth defect. And then this last one is the neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. It's very similar to the ARND diagnosis, but this comes out of the new uh, DSM-5, and that's a mental health um, diagnostic guide. So now we can diagnose this in mental health settings with someone that knows how to use the diagnostic statistical manual. Um, and again, it has parameters, and we do need to know that mom drank we can't just diagnose it based on the effects that we're seeing in the child. Fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorders is a, basically it's a continuum of effects. So we can see very mild intellectual or behavioral issues, some temper tantrums, uh, just real, um, uh, real short fuse to um, uh, mild learning problems in school, maybe problems with math, telling time to very extreme um, problems with problems with learning, uh, that type of thing. And then we can also see profound disabilities or premature death as a result of the alcohol use. So we do see a high percentage of miscarriages um, based on alcohol consumption. Oftentimes they're not diagnosed as such, but they are there. Um, the other thing to kind of pay attention to is that um, they, uh, some of these um, things are not caused solely by prenatal alcohol. 
alcohol exposure. And um, these are caused solely by prenatal, sorry, and they are not hereditary. So this isn't something you can just do a blood test and determine. So it's really important that you learn how to have that conversation around their drinking um, and drinking patterns. And these um, injuries do last a lifetime. Oftentimes, uh, we can see the, these effects throughout the adult life span that you see in early childhood. But with early intervention, and I have to stress that because the most protective factor found through the longitudinal study of Dr. Ann Streisgut was a diagnosis before the age of six was extremely protective for um, this disorder. So if you look at this face, you'll see the classic, what we call the classic facial dysmorphia or abnormalities that occur to that face. And that face is really kind of disrupted around day 22 or so in that developing fetus um, embryo. So it's very, very early in the pregnancy prior to women knowing they're pregnant. And so what you'll see here, the A point A to B is what we call the palpebral fissure and that distance is shortened and you can measure that. And then there is a smoothing of the philtrum, that nice little ridge that runs on the lip under the nose and to the upper lip. And then you also have a thinning of the upper lip. And that's your classic facial characteristics that you would see with someone with fetal alcohol syndrome or some of those features with someone with partial FAS. Unfortunately, that is the uh, tip of the iceberg. Most individuals that have prenatal alcohol exposure will not have the face. Um, with fetal alcohol syndrome, again, you're also looking at that height weight that I spoke of, and then you're also looking at um, brain injury, whether it's um, head circumference at or below the 10th percentile or structural abnormalities, or you may have recurrent um, non-febrile seizures. So you have uh, seizures that are not caused by fever, and that could be another indicator. Uh, this is a photo that was taken with Dr. Sterling Claren in Washington State, and it's just showing two uh, six-week-old babies that were born and died at six weeks. Uh, the six week on the left is a normal brain. The baby died of a respiratory um, illness. And the one on the right is a baby that the brain wasn't viable to survive life. And that was uh, uh, a six-week-old child with fetal alcohol syndrome. But you can see that there's a significant brain injury. The brain not only is um, damaged and odd shaped, but it's also very small. Um, just You can just see how much damage alcohol can cause a developing brain. So again, I've been kind of alluding to the prevalence. So they looked at um, uh, this was a one study, and within that study, they did a second grouping. So they picked six or four communities across the United States, and one of them was a Rocky Mountain community um, in the Plains, and that one primarily was in a Native American community. Um, and the prevalence of the rates were between 10.9 to 25.2 per thousand for FAS and partial FAS, which is extremely high. And then the complete FASD uh, was about 24 to 48 per thousand. That included ARND. But when they looked at the whole United States, they looked at uh, San Diego, um, they looked at uh, uh, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, and um, in this area, we saw rates of one in 20 uh, children in first grade classrooms were uh, affected by, uh, by an FASD. So that's pretty um, concerning and it's a lot more prevalent than we first thought. So when um, looking at maternal alcohol exposure, I kind of alluded to that we really need to do good documentation. And I can't tell you how many times we've had someone uh, send a kid over to a diagnostic clinic for a diagnostic evaluation. And all through the chart, it talks about her cocaine use, but there's no mention of alcohol. Um, and so that's really uh, disheartening because if we don't have the FAS or partial FAS, um, we really have limited ability to diagnose this unless you're using the Washington State Diagnostic uh, Criteria. Um, and that can be found um, at the uh, Washington State DPN Clinic. And that's a different way. So it takes out the causal effect of alcohol. So you get the brain injury diagnosis, but you're not saying that alcohol caused or didn't cause it. 
So documented maternal alcohol exposure is really often important, but often difficult to obtain. And I think the more we start to have this conversation in clinical settings where we're really having conversations, talking to patients, and really, um, you know, making it a normal event to have that conversation about typical daily drinking, that then women are going to start to feel more comfortable talking about it. We do know that birth moms especially feel stigmatized and they're often hesitant to admit using alcohol during their pregnancy. So another way to get that information is to talk about prior to pregnancy, you know, prior to knowing you were pregnant, um, on average, how much did you drink? And on average, how many days did you drink? And then once, uh, at what point did you realize you were pregnant? So now you have your window of exposure and then you can talk about um, once you knew you were pregnant, what were your what was your intent to do with your alcohol use? And then you give them permission to talk about what they wanted to do. And then you can ask them, or you can say, what did you want to do about your drinking depending on their education level? And then once you have that information, then you can talk about what were you able to do. And that gives them permission to really start to talk about during that pregnancy what they're struggling with. And I think it's really important to have these conversations. Um, in the uh, DSM-5, uh, documentation is not essential for the FAS diagnosis, but it is for the NDPAE, which is the DSM-5, or for the alcohol-related birth defects. So again, um, keeping that in mind that we really um, need to have that maternal alcohol um, drinking uh, in the chart, even if it's low levels, because once you start having the conversation and they feel safe, they'll start to um, share more information. One of the ways providers can ask this question is, um, uh, how often do you drink beer, wine, or liquor? And I believe this comes out of the um, American Academy of Pediatrics. So that's a way to start the conversation. And then in the past three months before you knew you were pregnant, how many times did you have four more drinks in a day? So again, we're looking for that binging episodes because women typically are not daily drinkers, but tend to be more binge drinkers and periodic or sporadic drinkers. Although there are women who are very much daily heavy drinkers. If she's drinking three drinks a day every day, you would miss that on this um, screen. So again, I like to ask both questions. During the pregnancy, how many times did you have four more drinks in a day? Again, looking for that binge episode. In the pregnancy, these questions are good, but you would need to have some rapport with the patient in order to ask it in this way. Um, so really developing that relationship, kind of getting some basic information and then going into more detail. I alluded to the Ann Streisga study that happened in uh, Washington State. It was a longitudinal study and they looked at individuals from uh, age uh, six to 51 years of age. And there was about 473 um, participants that were in this. And one of the key findings was 94% um, of the full um, group had some form of mental health problem. The, I think the highest level was anxiety and then depression or, or right in side by side. Um, they were not as impacted by protective factors like early diagnosis um, or um, living in a healthy, stable, uh, nurturing, loving environment. So again, mental health problems is a key feature with these individuals. It could be that um, the mom had co-occurring drinking um, disorder. So she was drinking, but it was kind of self-medicating some kind of a mental health anxiety disorder that was passed on. It could be that there's a brain injury that kind of manifests to a similar mental health problems, which I know that's to be true with some cases. And it could also be that the client themselves knows that they don't fit in and they're different and so they are struggling with a lot of depression and sometimes anxiety and that again is also true. So there, I think it's a combination of the three. We also saw the disrupted school experience. Um, around 60% of 12 and older had difficulty in school. So uh, maintaining uh, their behaviors in the classroom, being able to um, not uh, have outbursts or, or fights or hitting, that type of thing. And so again, really needing that good IEP um, 
that process in the school, wraparound services, and that a clinic um, pediatrician is going to be a real key person in, in this child's life to be able to educate that school on why this child's acting the way they are and, and, and then the strategies that you can use to help with interventions. Trouble with the law was also very high, and again, I think that has to do primarily with executive function deficits that we often see, as well as um, the immaturity and uh, uh, they're easily taken advantage of. So again, um, we really want to have good wraparound services, good um, uh, folks that are watching the children, making sure that they're um, where they're supposed to be and that they have good people around them that are helping them make good, healthy choices. Confinement was either mental health and or jail, and that was around 50%, 12 and older. And the inappropriate sexual behavior was around 50%. And again, um, this behavior wasn't necessarily a perpetrary predatory type of sexual behavior, but maybe more of a um, age variation difference. So if you, um, like if you were interviewing a 13 year old with a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, they may tell you their best friend is a nine year old neighbor because that's where they are at their developmental stage. But again, because they're in a different sexual place with their body, they may be acting out inappropriately with a younger child. Or they may just not understand and they're just curious, but they don't have those filters to stop that impulsive behavior. So again, really important for them to have really good um, folks watching their behaviors. They also were at higher risk for alcohol and drug problems. So again, really kind of monitoring that and making sure that families understand that they are at risk. Um, and that could be a variation of issues from uh, alcoholism um, uh, being passed on to um, just feeling anxious and not welcome and, and drinking to, to self-medicate. Some of the problems that we'll see with individuals with an FASD are the cognitive developmental deficits, and we can see those in um, just a lots of different area, areas like a lower IQ, although they don't necessarily have a uh, below normal IQ, it, it may be just a shift to the left. So we see changes that would have, they may have had a higher functioning level if they hadn't had the alcohol exposure. Uh, we'll see specific disabilities, especially in math. And then we may see um, poor grades in school, struggling with their performance in verbal and nonverbal skills, as well as um, having different reactions, uh, movements to stimuli and people. So we can see um, lots of different areas that are impacted. And then if you're looking at the um, executive function deficits, this is a really classic room or desk that you would see with a child with an um, FASD. Um, and this uh, executive function issues uh, are really involved with that poor organization and planning. So these individuals really struggle with that. So that's going to impact schoolwork. That's going to impact um, how they put things together in their life. Uh, they're very concrete, so things need to be um, put to them in a language that's concrete, not abstract. Um, they lack inhibition, so they're often very impulsive. They have difficulty grasping cause and effect. So when we use um, the typical parenting strategies, um, they oftentimes aren't that effective with these kids, so we really need to step out of the box and think of other ways to do this. They have difficulty with multi-step directions, so again, giving them one instruction at a time, making sure they have time to process that direction, and then watching to make sure that they're able to re re, uh, retrieve the memory of the request that was asked so that they can do that. They also have difficulty doing things and thinking in new ways. So they might get really into one pattern and they got it and they're good at it, but then all of a sudden circumstances change as like maybe a parent who has an FASD who's parenting a two-month-old and they're good at giving that two ounces of milk, but all of a sudden baby's four months and they have a real hard time adapting to knowing that that baby now needs four ounces of milk. So lots of areas where you need to be paying attention. They also have poor judgment and this is often why they end up in the criminal justice system. Um, also why they end up with multiple injuries and, and often these children will die early in life in, uh, because of poor judgment, making bad decisions around um, their uh, life choices. 
and then again having inability to um, apply knowledge to new situations so they might know that you really have to stop at this crosswalk and look both ways because they were taught that over and over but they go down three blocks and they don't look at that crosswalk so again really paying attention to that type of um, deficits with executive function is important Motor function delays, we can see pretty much uh, both uh, large motor as well as fine motor delays. Um, and so you may have a child who's really clumsy. They may have balance problems due to some of the brain injury. They may show small tremors. So they have problem with fine motor uh, coordination, hand-eye coordination, difficulty with dexterity, difficulty with um, looking at the board and then writing something down on paper. Um, as they're uh, small infants, they have pro poor sucking in babies a lot of times, so we really need to assess their ability to feed well and making sure that that newborn's going to get a good adequate feed in. Um, so we will also see delayed milestones with these guys because of the motor delays. So we may see delays in crawling, walking, sitting, and then again delays in writing and drawing. So that's something to really pay attention to and work with the family to try to help um, offset those delays as much as uh, possible. Um, attention deficit with hyperactivity. Uh, this is a diagnosis that's often given uh, to children with an FASD. In the study that they did with um, the NIAAA with the four communities I mentioned earlier, there were about 660 cohort children that were screened and mothers were interviewed. And of that, 222 had an FASD in first grade. And of those, two had an actual diagnosis of FASD. Uh, the rest had other diagnoses that were not appropriate to that disability. But um, this is one that they often get as attention deficit with hyperactivity. So they appear busy, over, overly active, inattentive, easily distracted, and then they have difficulty with calming down, completing tasks, or moving uh, from one task to another. And then parents may report that child's attention changes from day to day, days on and off. We also know, though, that with fetal alcohol a spectrum disorder, that they often have memory retrieval issues. So when we look at inattentive, uh, maybe they're trying to process and they're a slow processor. Or maybe they were asked to complete a task and then they get distracted not distracted, but aren't able to retrieve that memory of what was asked of them. So they look like they got distracted, but maybe they didn't complete the task because they stopped having the ability to access that uh, short-term memory that's often uh, prevalent in this population. They also are often diagnosed with attention uh, conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder and bipolar disorder. So those are things to think about when kids are coming in with multiple diagnoses. Um, and then we also have poor social skills. This is really common. And in fact, there was an intervention done out of UCLA where they really worked with um, children with the Bruins Buddy um, intervention and found it to be very effective in getting children to be able to um, uh, interact more uh, pro-socially. Um, so they, they often don't fear strangers. They're often scapegoated, naive, gullible, and they're taken advantage of. But they also have inappropriate choice of friends. Uh, they do prefer younger friends, and they have adaptive skills that are significantly below their cognitive potential. So again, these kids really want friends. They want to be a part of the group, but they often are not included because they're oddities and not reading social skills. So it's a really important uh, piece to help teach um, children how what uh, teach about the pro-social skills, about what what's proper body distance. Um, what are the appropriate ways to engage in inner uh, play activities and how to make play dates, those type of things are important. Um, we also have other problems, so just having difficulty, uh, sensory integration problems to taste and touch are very common. Difficulty reading facial expressions. Um, we also see difficulty responding appropriately to common parenting practices, not understanding that cause and effect issue. Um, so, you know, they might have a, a small mishap with the baby because they don't understand cause and effect. Um, baby laying on the couch, mom not paying attention, baby rolls off and gets a bump on the head, that type of thing. 
they also um, have difficulty with memory deficits. So that's really important to help them with memory aids when, as they're parenting or even when you're trying to get them to complete tasks and chores and that type of thing. Um, approaches for an FASD treatment uh, from a provider perspective, we're really wanting the provider to um, really first, you know, ask the question around mom's drinking to really help that family with a, um, you know, a family home and to really help integrate their um, that individual with an FASC into the greater medical system. So you may have to help that child get into a neuropsych eval, into speech and language, into um, uh, uh, OT, occupational therapy and physical therapy. There's lots of areas that these kids may need help. So you want that medical home. Um, it's really important that they are seen uh, with a consistent provider um, and that they're um, that they're really identified and then managed so that we really are following this child to see how they do. We often will get newborns that are exposed that seem fine, and that's what we call a watch and wait. So we're paying attention. We know the exposure happened. We're, we're really trying to watch, and then if we do see delays or problems, we go for a uh, diagnosis and then managing the effects. And then again, they should be in a medical home setting so that they can be followed properly. Other medical issues that we may see with these individuals, um, there's many across the board, but these are just some that kind of stood out. So we may see problems with um, eye and vision hearing um, impairment. And that's off because as you saw in that one slide with the brain development over time, the eyes and hearing are also developing over time. We saw a lot of chronic otitis media um, or chronic ear infections with these individuals. We also saw problems with um, nerve um, damage around the eyes. So we may see that with hearing loss, we may see vision loss or strabismus, and uh, or we may see ptosis or drooping of the eye. Um, and then also we'll see um, growth concerns and immune system concerns. And I think um thanks uh we're at the question phase and i hope you enjoyed the um the, the webinar thank you well thank you very much to pamela and katie for the fantastic presentation um we did have a few um frequently asked questions that we did want to make sure to uh to ask today um, the first question is, what is the role of behavioral health in this process? And what are some steps to improve collaboration for patients who screen high? Um, well, this is Pam, and I, I believe that behavioral health plays a huge role because there's a continuum of use and there's a continuum of effects. So when we work with these clients that are even drinking at very high rates, they still may not be experiencing consequences to that drinking to where they would be receptive to an inpatient substance abuse treatment program, but they would be receptive to early intervention, uh, brief interventions, and sometimes even outpatient counseling. So again, working with that behavioral health team to kind of move this client into to the appropriate door uh, is really important. And I also think that the behavioral health team really needs to understand prevention and um, how to work with clients to reduce risk drinking. It's not always about abstinence. Sometimes if they're of childbearing age, they're not pregnant, uh, we really wanna work with them on that. And I think the other really key piece is having a warm handoff. Um, we found in the clinics in tribal communities where behavioral health was able to be in the clinic at least one uh, individual over at, uh, during the different times that the clinic ran with their own room that, you know, you could screen that individual and then just do a warm handoff right over to that behavioral health individual rather than sending that person out the door where they often did not show up for that behavioral health appointment. Anything else, Katie? No, I think that answered it perfectly. Thank you. All right. And then the next question is, in your experience working with tribes, what screening tools have been most accepted and easy to implement? 
Um, we, we worked, the tribes we worked with, they were very interested either in the uh, screening brief intervention referral to treatment, which is known as the SBIRT model, and they used the audit screen. Um, often uh, tribes were already doing that some, uh, or else they were open to the audit C uh, screen, which is nice. I mean, some had other variations, but wanted to adapt to that. And then they also were very, very receptive to the choices intervention and felt that that was a really important piece in their community. Um, and that was something that was well received in tribal communities. Katie, how about yourself? Yeah, and I would say the choices intervention too was adapted for each tribe. So the materials had uh, phrasing and pictures and scenarios that were more appropriate to very specific settings. So I think. The good thing about choices is it is highly adaptable for different types of people in different settings. Yeah, that's true. And we did work with tribes to make that fit. So the choices intervention initially in the research were, were uh, four um, sessions and they lasted anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Um, they found through the research that two sessions were adequate to get that intervention across. And then because of clinics, uh, struggle with time and that um, and then getting clients back for that second session some clinics um, actually went to a one uh, front-loaded model where they did the entire intervention in one session and then tried to get the patient back for a second visit if they were able to. We had one tribe in uh, South Dakota that actually wanted to do uh, an additional session because the women really enjoyed coming to the clinic. So it's really adaptable to what that clinic's needs are. If you're an STD clinic, that person doesn't typically come to you all the time. They're just there for that one reason and so they may not want to come back if you're their primary care provider and they're comfortable with you or it's the um, clinic that the tribe uses and it's convenient and easy to get to they may be more apt to want to go to several sessions so that's one of the adaptable ways to to do that as well as who does the intervention all righty and then the final question we have is, can you have patients complete an alcohol screen on paper before their visit, like in the lobby at registration or with a MA before the doctor comes in? This is Katie. I would say yes to that. I think that actually might be helpful, but of course the practitioner provider would need to follow up with that and talk about that very candidly. But I do think that might help to help screen people and to maybe even be a little bit more efficient on the time in order to know who should talk to that person. Should it be behavioral health? Should it be someone who is trained as a counselor for choices? Or would it be some other type of medical provider if someone, for example, needs contraception? Yeah, I agree. And I think in the, in the studies, when we did uh, research to practice, um, one of the STD clinics was a Baltimore clinic, and they actually did do paper first because that was the most efficient use of their clinic. Uh, patients typically showed up and waited for a, a long time to get seen. So while they were waiting, they were able to uh, do the actual written screen. I think the other important piece is language, making sure that it's readable or having somebody that might be able to assist with it if they're not quite sure how to answer questions appropriately. But it can definitely be used and, and often is very effective as Katie indicated. Excellent, and if folks have uh, individual questions, um, they can reach out to you at the emails provided on the screen, correct? Yes. And, 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 uh, yeah, and, and, and Katie and I are both trained trainers for the choices intervention. Um, and so if somebody's interested in actually getting that for their clinic where it's actually, um, it takes about two days, uh, two full days to really get the training that you need to be able to implement this. Um, but with this webinar, that would decrease some of that time. But I think it's a, a really important intervention. Excellent. And just to wrap things up, um, we are going to be uploading an archive of this webinar.
onto the Intertribal Council of Michigan's website at www.itcmi.org slash ASBI webinar. So feel free to write that down and go to the website. Um, Katie and Pamela were generous to offer us a uh, plethora of resources and uh, several PDFs that are available to download. And they are up on the website right now. And the video of the webinar and the evaluation are all gonna be available as well as the uh, PowerPoint slides for the webinar. So feel free to visit www.itcmi.org slash ASBI webinar to download all the resource materials. And with that, we will say thank you very much to everybody for attending, and we will go ahead and wrap up the webinar. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Thank you.